Um, again, Leo Tolstoy, who was kind of considered the founder of, of Christian anarchism, uh, he actually became acquainted with Mormonism. Uh, I can't quite remember how exactly, but somehow he came across some books about Mormonism. And he was actually pretty impressed by some of these basic economic and political ideas that I've been mentioning. And so Tolstoy made the comment that the Mormon people teach the American religion. Their principles teach not only of heaven and its attendant glories, but how to live so that their social and economic relations with each other are placed on a sound basis. If that people follow the teachings of the church, nothing can stop their progress. It will be limitless. Of course they didn't. They ended up abandoning these ideas and embracing capitalism, which is unfortunate. But at any rate, Tolstoy recognized the value of these principles, at least. Um, another... Um, comment about Mormonism comes from the Catholic Worker. This was during the Great Depression from the Catholic Worker newspaper, again, famous Christian anarchist newspaper. And this is what it says, um, again, during the Great Depression. Mormons have taken the lead from Catholics in caring for their needy. The Church of Latter-day Saints has met the crisis in a manner which ought to shame our so-called Catholic charitable organizations. In every stake, which is like a, like a group of congregations, in every stake, unemployed men and women were set to work sewing, farming, canning, repairing shoes and clothing, collecting furniture and gifts from church members and non-members. All work was voluntary. No money was paid. To each man and woman, a work certificate was given. When a worker needs anything, he, prevents, he presents his certificate to the bishop of his congregation, and he is given what he and his family need. And it kind of goes on. Um, at any rate, so that's just to kind of review um, some of the basic ideas behind Christian anarchism and also the aspects of Mormonism that are supportive of uh, anarchism or libertarian socialism. And uh, you guys have any questions? I guess. Do. First, let's give him a hand. Oh, sorry. Um, so, uh, for a Christian anarchist and like a pacifist, uh, what do you see as like the the primary uh, mode of resistance that the working people should use against the, the bourgeoisie? I mean, like, how do we expropriate the wealth of the, the ruling class? Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I don't have like tons of answers about this. I'm not like a strict pacifist personally, but um, I would say again, just through general strike and other largely nonviolent means. Like there's problems with armed struggle. Um, I, I guess there are a lot of arguments to be made for armed struggle and armed revolution, but there's, I think there's also a lot of problems with it. And from having lived in like Iraq, for example, and even in Palestine, um, I don't always know if that's really the best way to go about things because it can lead to some pretty bad consequences, especially for the people that the revolutionaries are supposedly fighting for. So I don't, I don't really have answers to that question necessarily, but I definitely have reservations about like armed, uh, armed struggle. Um, but again, general strike, um, major um, protests, things like that. I wish I had a better answer, maybe talk to Greg. <laughs> <laughs> um. How do you see like the antagonisms that different religions will have towards each other uh, hindering, say, international movements uh, as you try and transcend borders through worker movements? Um, well, I think a lot of the basic struggles that someone as an anarchist or a socialist would be involved in are really like common to um, to everybody. So, like, I remember, you know, a lot of people do say, well, religion is really divisive, and it's caused all these wars and things like that, and, you know, I'm sure that's been the case at times. But, like, um, for example, when I was in Iraq, uh, working there, I um, obviously met a lot of really militant Muslims. Same thing in Palestine, too. I remember um, uh, meeting a lot of really militant Muslims, and, you know, I was against the occupation, 
when I was in Iraq and we'd talk politics with these militant Muslims and they didn't want the Americans there. I thought that was bad. I'm like, yeah, I think the occupation is bad. That's why I'm here is to try and help out a little bit doing human rights stuff. And so we were always got along great. And then they hear things about how Mormons, um, you know, don't do things like drink alcohol typically, or um, and Muslims don't do that either. So instead of being like, oh, you guys are Christians and bringing up all the different things that you could potentially argue about since you're from different religions, people would always be like, oh yeah, you guys are just like us, you know, and like really emphasize the common things. And I would, then people would ask me directly, well, what do you think about Muhammad? Was he a prophet? And I'd be like, no. <laughs> if I thought he was a prophet, I would be a Muslim. <laughs> and you don't think Jesus was the Son of God or the Messiah, but that's fine. You know, if you decide that that's the case one day, you can become Christian. And, but as long as we were united on, you know, these political questions, like, Muslims were so nice to me in, in Iraq and in Palestine. And when I would tell them about Mormonism, obviously they weren't interested in converting, and they'd sometimes try to convert me, which I wasn't interested in, but, you know, we'd get along just great. So maybe that's like the exception, but um, a lot of religions do have progressive elements to them, and if that's what you emphasize and have in common, then I think it's really easy to work with people from other religions. So. Oh, sorry. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, because uh, it's, it's been a while since I've cracked the Doctrine and Covenants. Um, doesn't the Doctrine and Covenants actually call for a Mormon state, specifically the state of Desiree, and actually the formation of an army of Zion? Yeah. Okay. So it's, there are also, not, not that anarchism is not compatible with Mormonism, but there are other forms of socialism that aren't necessarily, com that are compatible with Mormonism. But are not necessarily pacifistic, but would yeah. accept. Yeah, I mean, Mormonism itself isn't, it's hard to make the argument from Mormonism, like from the Book of Mormon, for example, that you should be a pacifist. It definitely makes the argument that war is bad, that militarism is bad, and that, you know, wars of aggression are bad and wrong, but it doesn't necessarily make the argument that you should be a pacifist. And in the Doctrine and Covenants, it doesn't, like, actually call for like a Mormon state, but a Mormon community, and the Mormon communities did have militias. I mean, one um, point of opposition that people I say, well, how can you be a Mormon and an anarchist? Because there's what's called one of the Articles of Faith um, that talks about how you're supposed to obey your rulers and obey the government, things like that. And especially when it came up with the Iraq War, and I'd be talking to people about, well, the Iraq War is wrong. And they'd be like, well, you know, George Bush is the ruler, and we're, you know, he's he's the government, and he's our ruler, so we're supposed to obey him. If he says to go to war, then that's the right thing to do. That's like the Mormon thing to do: is support him and go to war. In fact, President Hinckley even basically said something like that in general conference, like in commenting about the war, like, "Hey, we're supposed to be subject to the authorities in the government." But Joe Smith himself led like a rebellion against the the state of Missouri. I mean, there was like fighting between the Mormon militia and um, the Missouri State Militia. I mean, he was in outright open rebellion against the government. Brigham Young did a lot of things in outright rebellion against the federal government when the federal government tried to send uh, the army to Utah. I think it was in 18, early 1850s. Um, so the other thing is that the Mormons, when they were practicing polygamy, when that was outlawed, they just kept doing it, and they all just went to jail, and the judges would be like, well, why are you guys doing this? And I'm like, well, we believe that's what God wants us to do, so you can like throw us in jail, like whatever. So there's many, many examples from Mormon um, history about resisting the government, disobeying the government. So, um, but generally speaking, again, whether you call something a state or, um, or, you know, a, a federation or whatever you want to call it, the basic idea is that you don't want it to be authoritarian. You want it to be as egalitarian as you can, so that. Ideally, there's not one person ruling over another. And so does that mean like you should never ever support the state or something? Well, maybe that's not what it means, but at least it means that it should, we should have a relatively egalitarian either state or federation or organization or whatever you want to call it. Yeah, um, well, I was, I was raised Mormon. So from my experience, I mean, like you said, like most are just, 
uh, war-loving, you know, conservative a-holes. Um, and like in reality, that's like in my experience, it seems like the people. If you were going to compare someone to the ancient, like within the structure of Jesus' time, to the Mormons, they would definitely be like the Pharisees, you know, uh, the people who are out preaching, wanting to show you how. Christian they are in reality they have absolutely no interest or you know, they don't give a they don't give a crap about poor people or people in general really you know um, so it seems to me like that's as far as the church goes like they, they're you know oh, gross um, <laughs> uh, you know as far as the church goes it seems to me like that's precisely what they are they represent that middle class uh, not the people in it necessarily but the church as a structure itself represents uh, that that middle class like um, they got to stick by all the rules. There's kind of like this love of mediocrity and conservatism. 